About this movie, Barbara Maitland of Maitland Hardware says Beetlejuice. Recently deceased, Barbara Maitland says Beetlejuice. And sandworm fancy writer Barbara Maitland says Beetlejuice. On this episode of Ruined Childhoods, we decide the fate of Beetlejuice. It's showtime. Re-re-reboot. Which one will it be? It's the Ruined Childhood Podcast. Greetings, Starfighters. <laughs> nice. I I went a little playful with the intro. I, I went a little bit off the typical format. I thought that it was appropriate for such a thing. Oh, very much so. No, that was the little, the it's showtime, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, here's the thing. First of all, welcome to Ruined Childhoods. Welcome, everybody. Everybody, you know, to everybody else. But... You know, yeah, we don't need to we don't need to do the the same thing every time. And for those of you who are listening to us for the first time, first of all, Hi. bienvenue, well, bien. Oh man, I I screwed it up. Welcome and bienvenue, welcome, come on there in. There you go. Sorry. Uh, um, but yeah, uh, yeah. You know, our our intro is usually a little different. We feature some uh snippets from critic reviews and letterboxed users and amazon yeah. critics yeah here's the thing we make our own rules this is our show we don't have anybody to answer to but ourselves so no. like screw society telling well, us what to do we we play by our own rules that's the beetlejuice way yeah, exactly. We don't go by what everyone else wants us to do. We do our own thing. And, you know, whatever the consequences are, we welcome them. Sure. Bring on the consequences. I also need to mention that uh, so we record using a remote recording platform similar to Zoom. I can say that because everybody's familiar at this point in time with Zoom. And uh, Dan and I make our names that appear, and this is just for our own amusement. No one's going to see this, but we like to kind of tie it in to like an actor in the movies or somebody related to movies or a character name. And being as his name is Dan, my name is John. This time I'm loving it because Dan decided to go by Dan E. Elfman, like E as in a middle initial, like Chuck like an e. Alfred Cheese. E. Newman. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And uh oh, as Chuck Danny Cheese. Elfman is the uh the composer for for Beetlejuice and I decided to go with Jono your caseworker because Juno is one of my favorite characters in this movie and um she's just fan bloody tastic. She's a she's a great character and and uh, as we'll get into I guess to foreshadow a little bit but I, Danny Elfman is the unseen star of this movie. Yeah, and okay, so this was what year? Eighty eight. Eighty eight, and I we're going to talk about the the movie, and and we'll go on. But I, I, you know, the, yeah, the name choice was was very much. I was like, yeah, ah, okay. And first, I do need to do a one more thing about our Dirty Harry episode, but I will say this since we're on the topic of Danny Elfman. As we play clips from Beetlejuice during this episode, here's your homework. Listen to the music. Listen to the score. Pay attention to it. There were certain clips that were chosen because of the way that the score kind of plays with what's going on on screen, and we'll do our best to describe what would be seen on screen at these moments. Uh, and yeah, like you are saying, Dan, Danny Elfman's score. Danny Elfman, who at this point was still pretty new to, you know, film scoring. He had done Pee Wee's Big Adventure. I think he would probably did something else between that and this, right? He did. Uh, he, yeah, he did. Well, he he did a bunch. And if you want to, and and if 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 you want to know more about Danny Elfman, uh, and and his career, I recommend not just like googling him. He uh, was on. Uh, WTF with Mark Marin not too long ago. Yeah, and I listened as, to that as one. he as he is my favorite film composer, I I had to listen and I was so interested to hear him 
uh, you know, kind of tell his story. But yeah, when he started scoring films, it was kind of a you know, like out of the blue type thing, right? For him, and because he had been, you know, the front man of of the the band Oingo Boingo, right? Which at, at, at the time he was scoring Pee Wee's Big Adventure, their biggest hit was Weird Science, right? Yeah, but they had appeared in movies. Their music has yes. had appeared in movies, but they did not score what. Yeah, well, and then actually, so speaking of an appearance, so and they, he actually he so he scored Back to School, in which the band also appears. I didn't know that. He, I don't remember it. We probably talked about him scoring Back to School because yeah. we did that episode. <laughs> it's in the archives. <laughs> but yeah, uh, okay. But I do have yeah, one more scored, thing about Dirty oh, Harry. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, I'll just. This is just going to be quick. I just need to amend something because I want to you know, do right by this instead of just leaving what I had said in the last episode without any kind of correction. But we made reference to Clint Eastwood's politics and the stunt that he pulled at, I believe, the, you know, RNC for oh, Mitt the Romney. 2012. The 2012, yeah. Mm-hmm. And where he, he spoke to Obama, which was the empty chair. And... Allegedly, he had uh, come out saying that he regretted doing that chair routine, and he had since spoken out about his distaste for Donald Trump's personality and Twitter presence, and uh, I think that Clint Eastwood just feels, uh, and this is me speaking for him, of course, but uh, it should come as probably no surprise to anybody, but like, I, you know, he definitely feels like there should be a dignity to the person in office as president. And Donald Trump certainly did not provide that. And um, also in this past, it was the the primaries for the uh, 2020 elections. Uh, he supported Michael Bloomberg. So didn't even, I mean, not like Michael Bloomberg is the most progressive, but uh, certainly, you know, has no, party allegiance when it comes to you know when it really comes down to the candidate so i do i just wanted to make sure that it was clear that uh for anybody who did listen to our dirty harry episode you know it's not like this is a person who is very firmly i mean clearly he's very pro law enforcement very pro second amendment guns so on and so forth but still you know knows that it's not just about the party. That's all I need to okay. say. No, I'm. Uh, I I appreciate you clearing that up because I feel like yeah, we were we were a little we we weren't a hundred percent certain on that. So, uh, and I actually went back and and rewatched the 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 speech. Oh, did that you he gave the where Ugh. he was talking to Mr. Obama in <laughs> in, in the chair? Yeah, it's a little unsettling. It's a little, yeah. It's just, it's just kind of weird and uncomfortable, and he just, he just kind of comes across a little like he comes across as senile, <laughs> right? And I remember it at the time. I, I certainly remember what was going on and thinking like, oh boy, all right, well, this is the end for Clint Eastwood. And as we discussed on the last episode, such is not the case, especially in terms of his career. He is in his nineties and active. You know, uh, active behind the camera. So, yep, yeah, absolutely, awesome. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, he that. just had he and, just had Romney fever. Yeah, well, and you know what? And when, when you think about Michael Bloomberg uh, and and Romney as candidates, I feel like they almost fall into you know, of the Venn diagram. They're kind of sure in in more similar territory. Mitt, Mitt Romney. Um, you know, showing uh, uh, you know, his integrity, uh, over the past over the past few years. So yeah, but that's not what we're talking about today. No, we're here to talk about fucking Beetlejuice. Yes. So I uh, we are we are recording this on a, the Friday before this comes out tomorrow, uh, which is 
the Saturday before this episode comes out. I will be seeing this at the uh, Northwest Film Center in Portland, Oregon's uh, open air cinema screening uh, and the at the rooftop of the uh, the Lloyd Center. So I am very excited, even though I just watched it the other day for the sake of this podcast. I'm excited to watch it again because this movie is just so damn fun. It's so rewatchable, and I mean, it, it, it has. I actually, I, I was about to say it has little to nothing to do with the running time, but I, I actually disagree. I, I disagree with what I was about to say. Uh, okay, <laughs> it is. This no. movie runs at a brisk. It is an. It is under ninety minutes. Yeah, it moves, and I, you know, it was one of those times where it's, I watched it and I was like, I could have used a little bit more but I know that it's not necessary. I'm just saying I could have used a little bit more because I would have wanted to just live in that world for a few more minutes, but that's about it. But I always want to leave a movie feeling like, oh, I could have used a little, not feeling not feeling like, oh, there were some, uh, some loose ends left untied or feeling like, oh, there were some, there was some ground that should have been covered that wasn't. But I want to, f- leave a movie feeling like oh i just could have used a bit more of that the feeling of the watching energy, that, the vibe. that movie mm-hmm. but and and that's what i love about a movie like beetlejuice is that <laughs> it's it, it's short enough and once you're familiar with it enough you you know you're not sitting there you, you know you can just put it on loop yeah <laughs> and have so, it in in the background. <laughs> yeah. So why don't I just do a, a little synopsis and, yeah. uh, and then we'll, we'll kind of dig a little bit deeper after that. And, uh, just in case anybody hasn't seen it, I feel like this is going to get into a little bit of a territory of spoilers. Spoiler alert. Adam and Barbara Maitland live a simple life in a quaint Connecticut village where they own a small hardware store. But when they get into a fatal car accident, Their lives are turned into, well, death. Their afterlife seems like it could be ideal, trapped together in their home forever. But what they don't expect is that a new family, the Dietzes, are moving in from New York, and the house doesn't stand a chance of remaining quaint, at least not for Delia, an eccentric artist who specializes in abstract sculpture. Her husband Charles, on the other hand, sees the house as a getaway and is keen on embracing its original charms. And then there's their daughter Lydia, a teen goth with an eye for photography and apparently has the gift of seeing ghosts. This discovery introduces her to Adam and Barbara, and they all get along swimmingly, except Lydia becomes obsessed with joining them in the afterlife. Despite befriending Lydia, Adam and Barbara want nothing more than to scare the Dietzes until they move out. Unsure of what to do, they consider making a deal with a possession specialist and agent of chaos for hire named Beetlejuice. Instantly regretting meeting with him, and later chastised by their caseworker, Adam and Barbara try and fail in scaring off the Dietzes due to their whimsical spirits. But Beetlejuice takes matters into his own hands and scares them silly until Barbara sends him back into their town model. But the Dietzes aren't deterred. In fact, they have arranged for Charles's boss, Maxie Dean, to come up for a private introduction to the ghosts in order to build it into a business proposal. This culminates into Otho, their interior designer, performing a seance to bring them back, not knowing that it will kill them for good. Mid-seance, Lydia summons Beetlejuice to help her stop it. He agrees, but only if Lydia marries him. He steps in, puts on a crazy display of ghoulness, and now it's up to Adam and Barbara to stop him. That's where I've decided to end it. Otherwise, it's just like too many details. So Michael Keaton is brilliant as Beetlejuice. Uh, He really brings... (laughs) such personality to what could be a i don't know typical ghoulish character hard to say i think that he i don't know he michael keaton's it and and, he, and the character benefits it it's funny to think about it because when you it's like you say he michael keaton's it but yeah uh-huh. when you think about what michael keaton had done up to this point gung ho Mr. Yeah. Mom, Night Shift. He Michael well, Keaton's it, but he's never quite he, Michael Keaton like this. Well, 
Uh, no, but I mean, he before all that stuff was a stand up and, you know, has a tendency to kind of take things a little bit further than they need to go. You know, he, right. he yes. is a physical actor who doesn't seem like somebody who's going to be a physical actor. Uh, and but he also knows when to hold back, like uh, a year later when he's Batman with Tim Burton again. Um, but I want to go through the rest of the cast because there's oh, some yeah. real yeah. gems in here. Uh, oh, so oh, Al- Alec Baldwin and Gina Davis are the Maitlands and they are just iconic. Uh, Jeffrey Jones, who we have found out as a monster in real life, uh, plays Charles Dietz. But uh, as a an actor, as a performer, he's fantastic in this movie. Um, it's just too bad that he's a... Uh, you know, a perverted Creep. monster. Uh, Catherine O'Hara as Delia Dietz. And this is one of those, you know, early Catherine O'Hara performances where that people who are only finding out about her from Shit's Creek are discovering it now and being like, holy shit, she's always been amazing. <laughs> Wait till uh, they get a little older and watch After Hours for the first time. Oh my God. Absolutely. Yeah. Incredible. Uh, Winona Ryder is Lydia, and she's absolutely amazing. This is definitely early career, but not earliest career. She's certainly, you know, she was child actor. She started really young, right? Yeah. Well, she was, I think, in Lucas before this. Right. I can't think of any other pre-Beetlejuice Winona Ryder roles other than Lucas. Um. Oh, what was the what's one I'm thinking of where she's a daughter? Um where she's a daughter? Where she well, I mean, I know that she's somebody's daughter always. Mermaid? Uh maybe that's what I'm thinking of. When yeah, is, that what was year post, was that? That was ninety. That was, there was Great Balls was of 90. Fire in eighty nine, where she played <laughs> Jerry Lee Lewis's cousin slash wife. Right. Yeah. So so she's fantastic in this. Um we have uh, Sylvia Sidney, who's just, uh, you know, her career leading up to this. She plays Juno, the caseworker, and her filmography is kind of incredible. She started in the 20s, and, oh, yeah. you know, we just have so many classics in her uh, in her resume. I'm just kind of looking at it right now. Um what do we have here? I have to like really dig deep because there's so many. And Tim Burton, while you're digging, Tim Burton had to beg her to yeah. to play this role. And she ended up, uh, I'm guessing she had a good time because she uh, worked with mm-hmm. Tim Burton again in her last film role in Mars Attacks. Yeah, uh, that's right. As the, uh, the, the grandmother. Um, Oh, I forget the the kid who plays the oh uh, is it Lucas Haas? Yes, yeah, like Lucas Haas's uh, grandmother. She's got one of the funny when she laughs after the aliens like go in and basically vaporize Congress, uh, and she and she just laughs. Yeah, they killed Congress. Yeah, she's amazing. So uh, in the '30s, she was in an American Tragedy, City Streets, uh, sit the street scene. Uh, she worked with uh, Hitchcock on Sabotage. She was in uh, Fury, the the Fritz Lang movie. Those were from 36. She's just been like at it for such a long time. And she's so hilarious as Juno, the caseworker. I love her. She's amazing. Um, as uh, Otho, we have Glenn Shaddix. And this is kind of a career defining role for him he's certainly been in other things but i feel like he's most memorable as otho yes so otho is the deets's interior designer but i really you know i was watching it very closely to see if there's any indication of like why he's always around and why he's this confidant to them and why he's so close with them but they don't really give that and uh, but we do find out from like little snippets that he's had such a storied past 
He's had, he, you know, he's dabbled in the paranormal. He's done all these other things. And he His just happens with to the be living the interior designer now. Yeah, it's so, so fascinating. We have Robert Goulet as Maxi Dean, Charles Dietz's boss, which is just like so fascinating that Tim Burton would put Robert Goulet in as this character. It's To me, that name is such a punchline. And I... Maybe in oh. 1988, it was it felt a little bit different. This and then Scrooged. <laughs> That's right. He was in Scrooged. I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, Damn Robert Daniel. Goulet. But then we have Dick Cavett as Bernard, uh, uh, Delia's agent. And uh, you very, I mean, I know he's acted a little bit other than this, but you'd normally never see him playing a character. He's, right. I think he's only played himself. I think there were maybe a couple other things where he's credited as having a a name that's not his, but uh-huh. it's it's fun to see him act because you know he's Dick Cavett. He's the Dick well, Cavett of the Dick Cavett Show, like iconic, you know, talk show host. His and, delivery, and his delivery is magnificent when he, uh, when he kind of tells Delia off. Uh, yeah, after... yeah. He's like, I've been losing money on you for blah 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 blah. Yeah, I I don't have that clip pulled, but uh, I, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, the it's just such a fantastic cast. They all work really well together, and um, you know, it's a small <laughs> cast. What's up? Well, and what's interesting is, uh, you know, Michael Keaton was not Tim Burton's. Right. First choice as Beetlejuice. His first choice was Sammy Davis Jr. Which is incredible. But when you think about it, there's certain lines when I hear like, I'm the ghost with the most, babe. I, I'm, oh yeah, I could see it like a Sammy Davis Jr. Beetlejuice would have been very different, clearly, but I would have been good. I feel like the Sammy Davis Jr. Beetlejuice doesn't necessarily fit the manic it's like not quite at the level of the manic nature of right. this movie like michael keaton's energy yeah matches what's been set up absolutely yeah no and, and like yeah you're right it would be interesting to see you know it's almost like you know how like back to the future uh it wasn't originally Michael J. Fox, you know, uh, you had Eric Stoltz in there and there's footage of Eric Stoltz as Marty McFly. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you almost wish that you could have seen that for other performances that got recast. And I know that Sammy Davis Jr. was never cast, but it's like you almost want to see those like hidden footage. The alternate timeline where Harvey Keitel stars in Apocalypse Now instead of Martin Sheen and Tom Selleck is Indiana Jones. Yeah. Eric Stoltz is in Back to the Future and Sammy Davis Jr. is Beetlejuice. But yeah. um, as soon as Michael Keaton, met, like the studio wanted Michael Keaton and Michael Keaton. Uh, and w- what's crazy about Michael Keaton. So 1988 was a huge year for Michael Keaton because he also did his most dramatic role to date. Like this is his most manic and comic. Yeah. In Clean and Sober, he plays an alcoholic right. in recovery. And won uh, won several uh, acting awards for that. Was was recognized, you know, for those critic circle awards where they'll recognize multiple performances. Was recognized mm-hmm. both for Clean and Sober and for Beetlejuice because you have to think he, he couldn't have done, you know, the the shooting schedules for those two films couldn't have been that far apart. And right. Yeah. To be able to access that part of your personality the the depth of your acting to be able to switch from one to the other yeah and i mean he's a great actor he's a great actor it's just that that it hadn't really been hit like the depth of of his talent i think was really exposed in 88 from both extremes because you had that the dramatic extreme pushing further than any of his other roles and the comic extreme pushing further than any of his other roles but You've also got it's and uh, to go on to other cast members. What's what's awesome is that Alec Baldwin is in this, who at at the time was 
you know, kind of like, you know, maybe one of those next big thing. Right. Like yeah. leading men. He he had this. He did. Mar- he was in Married to the Mob. Yep. Um, And Working Girl that year. Yeah, he had a a smaller role in Working Girl. Yeah. 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 He had a, a smaller role, but he's, he's still like he's still really good in it. And yeah. he. uh but what I enjoy about Alec Baldwin is even as he was becoming this leading man, I mean, he would be in doing Hunt for Red October in yeah. two years' time, it is that he – there there seems to be room for these roles. Absolutely, yeah. And I I think I read somewhere, probably IMDb trivia, that you know he doesn't consider this to be one of his best better performances – but for me, I feel like this is such a great performance of his because it's not like he's playing his character to be a romantic lead. It's a very sincere character who's just like a likable down-home guy. And what's so fascinating about the world of Beetlejuice in this like Connecticut town is that it is timeless. Like, this town in every aspect could exist the same exact way right now. You know, even the same 80s Volvos <laughs> that people are driving, like <laughs> you could still see them like existing the way that they are. Yeah, so, and and um, I want to get back to Alec Baldwin's performance, but first yeah. just a little observation because you mentioned the Volvo. Adam and Barbara drive a Volvo. That's the car that they're killed in. And yeah. Volvos, especially at that time in the late 80s, were really known for like they they were like the safest car on right. on the market. Remember the movie Crazy People even did a take on that with yeah. with Dudley Moore's advertisement like you know boxy safe. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> but I wonder if that was like a play on that that they died in this Volvo oh, that saying I'm like sure. even even a Volvo can't protect you from fate. Uh, but going back to Alec Baldwin's performance, right? What I really enjoyed about it this time like watching it for the 167th time uh and it keeps getting funnier and it keeps getting funnier every <laughs> time you watch uh, it. Uh, oh boy he's simple adam is simple yeah. he and he misreads and deceased him, as diseased diseased <laughs> yeah he doesn't get he doesn't get certain things he's very so I, i'm sorry and i know i he's, keep cutting cutting you off <laughs> No, no, no. He is the kind of guy who would own a hardware store, who likes to work on his little projects. He's maybe not, you know, educated and book smart, but he has his passions and he loves what he does. And he's a sincere person. When I, when Barbara and Adam come back from seeing Juno the second time and they have altered their appearances for the purpose of scaring the Dietzes, And Barbara quickly transforms back to herself when she sees Lydia. And Adam can't figure out how to get himself back to normal. And he's, like, speaking in his, like, normal, like, gentle voice. But he's still got this, like, crazy, like, scary face going on. It's amazing. And it's not like it's played over the top. It's just, like, so perfect. Right. And the the script, which the script was originally much much darker, and you know went through quite a few uh, rewrites. But the script does a wonderful job of setting up the Maitlands as, um, it, you get so much information too from from so little. You get just from the introduction to the Maitlands that they are they're good people. They're a couple who are in love. They yeah. are childless and as it is so subtly but effectively revealed this is an issue right so uh, that leads me to the character of jane butterfield played by annie McEnroe, who's fantastic and you know she doesn't have a lot of credits to her name but she's got some really good ones she was in wall street uh and i mean obviously she's in beetlejuice um, <laughs> so this is the a clip of, of Jane, uh, when we first meet Jane talking to Barbara. Hi, Barbara. Hi. I'm glad I caught you. Heard you were on vacation. That's right, Jane. Complete vacation. Honey, today I'm 260. 
thousand no, dollars. It's six forty-five in the morning. This offer is real, from a man in New York City who only saw a photograph. Jane, don't send people photos of our house. He wants to bring the wife and family up here for some peace. Why? That's exactly what we're looking for. But Barbara, this house is too big for you. It really ought to be for a couple with a family, you know. Oh, Pumpkin, I didn't mean anything. It's just that, really, this house Jane, is too big. I'll see you in a few weeks, okay? Okay. All right. Think about it. Take care. I love how much you get from that interaction and the way that it's blocked, like they're, they first start talking like through the window. The information about how it's 6.45 in the morning, which is something that I uh. never even picked up on until like listening to it right now. Like you just get so much information about who these people are and what this town is like from just those brief interactions. Right. And now while we're talking about Jane, and I do want to get back to the Maitlands before we, we talk about the Dietzes, because mm-hmm. the, the contrast between them is so wonderfully set up. So here's a question that I think I've always had in my mind, and now it's finally time to address it. What is Jane's? Jane refers to the to Adam and Barbara being family later on right. when yes. they when the Dietzes are moving in and Lydia asks... I don't know. Right. I don't know. If why you don't have, I go play that? Why don't I play that oh, clip right now? Clip. This is while uh, the Dietzes are doing some remodeling and uh, they must have just recently moved in and Jane comes up and speaks to Lydia. What happened to the people used to live here? They drowned. Yes, they were family. I was devastated. Here, Pat. Is this the key to the attic? That's a skeleton key. That key will open any door in the house. Give that to your father. And you might mention that I single-handedly decorated that house in case he needs any any advice in that arena. Have come see. So I don't get the impression that she means literally that they're family. I think that she really just means that as in like they were very close in her eyes. Clearly, Barbara and Adam could do without Jane. Right, right. Though I do love that Jane and her daughter wear matching outfits. They were matching outfits, and I don't know if you heard in that clip, but at the very beginning, you hear a window rolling up. So they roll, they, they're they in their car, they pull up, and the daughter, who's in the back seat, as she sees Lydia coming up to the car, rolls yeah. up her window. Yeah. Like, as if, I'm scared of this person, I'm rolling up my window. And it's one of those things that I didn't even notice until this last watch, <laughs> where I was like, what a funny detail. Oh, totally. But yeah, no, Jane is such an asshole. Uh, yeah. and, and well, also the other funny thing is that she talks about how she decorated the house and it's kind of like she's offended that they're redoing the house. Meanwhile, Barbara and Adam were also redoing the house. Yeah. <laughs> at, the, at the beginning. Or at least I, I think they were. They were, you know, doing all these projects. Well, I think that it was mostly the model that they were working on. I can't remember exactly what their conversation was. Wasn't but I don't Barbara that... like do, looking at wallpaper, or wallpaper or something like that? Oh, or... if she did say that, it t- I totally missed it. I, um, yeah, I don't. But, um, yeah, the Maitlands—they're so the Ma- just this. And Gina Davis, we haven't really talked about her yet. And on this podcast, we have talked about Gina Davis at length. She seems to be a very common thread because all of her movies seem to be these gems that need to be discussed constantly i mean uh, yeah yeah. if you've listened if you've listened before even to just one other episode chances are you've heard mention of gina davis she came up recently oh what was the movie we were talking about where oh was the uhf uh episode uhf she's not even in that but uh so yeah she was in Earth Girls Are Easy, uh, you know, that, and Long it's, Kiss it's interesting. Long Kiss Goodnight. But I'm just thinking about the Fletch. movies leading up to this. Oh, uh, yes. Right. She, so she was in Fletch. Uh, she was in Tootsie, <laughs> you know? So she's in all of these movies early on. And, and this is a, you know, one of her earlier, like, starring roles. And uh, I don't know. She's She just plays it so well. And it's such a different character from, like, a lot of her earlier stuff. You know, just like a quaint townie. Uh, How did we not mention Transylvania 65000 just now when we were talking about Gina Davis's earlier credits? Oh, my God. What's wrong with us? Oh, 
man, I don't know. <laughs> hey, I'm 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 quilled up. I got I got the day quill going. Oh through, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll blame uh, that. <laughs> sure. So yeah, Gina Davis. Um, you know, really showing how flexible she is in her acting talents with a movie like this, where you you'd think you know no brainer but she you know hadn't played anything like this before I've, i feel like she's done a lot of stuff similar to this since where she's more of a down to earth you know just uh you know it's it's hard to say as i'm listening to her as i'm thinking about her other like speechless uh where she reunites with michael keaton um but her roles are so She's got a lot of variety, and of course, this is j- this is not long before she does the Accidental Tourist, for which she wins an Oscar. Um, right. So Gina Davis really like she's she's just on the verge here. Uh, I think much like Alec Baldwin, like they were like really you know their careers were both really picking up a lot of steam. Yeah. So just real quick, I want to read in order the Gina Davis's movies. Okay, and, and uh, not, I won't go too far in. So we've got Tootsie, which we've covered on this podcast. Fletch, which we've covered on this podcast. Transmitting a 6,000, which we've covered on this podcast. The Fly, which we, I'm sure, will cover on this podcast. Beetlejuice, which we're talking about literally right now. Earth Girls Are Easy, covered on the podcast. The Accidental Tourist, which maybe we should. Maybe this is our sign telling us that we need to cover The Accidental Tourist. We've uh, mentioned quick it Change, I've never which seen we've it. talked about yeah. in the podcast. Thelma and Louise, which I'm sure we'll get to. Uh, a League of Their Own, Hero, which is a, a really fascinating movie that we should definitely talk about sometime. Yeah, so that's just going up to 1992. And man, look, and, that's well, amazing. Did you say League of Their Own? I missed that. I, missed I did. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you did. You yeah. totally said it. Uh, right. Absolutely incredible. Uh, there's there's a, f- a few more before Long Kiss Goodnight, which we've covered. Uh, and then I think that's the only other one that we've talked about on the on the podcast but right but i really is doing covering a cutthroat a, island uh i could see us doing a cutthroat island easy absolutely yeah. but so so gina davis and alec baldwin play this couple to perfection especially because like look all right they're other than that they seem to be having trouble conceiving which is one of the, right. their their goals for this little uh staycation um yeah they they're happy yeah like they're happy they would like a child they would they would like to have a child they are they are happy enter the deetses who when we meet them are i i don't want to say they're basically like they're dysfunctional at this point you and for good reason for good reason yeah you've got so you've got first of all Charles, who is presumably widowed and also coming off of a nervous breakdown, which yeah. is not it like it's not flat out mentioned, I think, but they talk about how I think like he kind of was working so hard he just yeah. overdid it and Yeah, you can tell that his boss, Maxi Dean, Robert Goulet, is kind of like over him as a person and just like doesn't give a shit about him. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to play this clip that I have that I called Meet the Dietzes. And uh, this is one where uh, please pay attention to the music because, and I'm going to try oh. to fill in some blanks where there's visual things uh, that you can't see. Oh, this is great. Just what the doctor ordered. Deets, welcome home. Charles. It's okay, there's no damage. Look, see, it's okay. Good, sturdy country craftsmanship. And look at that kitchen. You're finally going to be able to cook a decent meal. <laughs> oh, no, you didn't. Come on, have a look. And I think this is when we see Lydia. No, it, yeah, it's no, Delia no, looking yet. around. And that's when they that's when we see Lydia, which you have that beautiful the the like harp. Yes. 
the innocence. I'm, can can you pause the sound clip for a second? Sure, Sorry. yeah, yeah. We've never done this before, but the music is so so. It's kind of like if you're familiar with the um, Prokofiev Peter and the Wolf, how right. the different music implies. Uh, not just you know symbolizes the different characters, but in, in like their nature and implies their nature. He Elfman is doing that so brilliantly in this, and using it, it. This film uses music in a way that uh, I, few other films do. I mean, actually, Edward Scissorhands being oh, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Like I just love. There's that. The, the, it's it's cohesive, but there's that change when Lydia comes in that you know the music tells you okay. The music tells you okay. We don't. We're not crazy about Delia. But we like right. we like Lydia. Absolutely. I, I'll I'll resume in a second here. But uh, something else that I want to note is that you know character entrances are something that's so important when any you're doing any type of storytelling. But in film, you know, you have the dimension of the the visual to it. And when we are introduced to Delia, you know that crash that we hear. That's uh, one of her sculptures in a case that's rolled and it hits the banister of the house. And, you know, it's kind of like her introduction is like already damaging. It's already Mm. impacting the house before we even see her face. And then we have Lydia. And when we first see her, the movers are bringing in a couch and she's laying on the couch as they're bringing it in. And, I think that that's such an awesome touch. It's a really great way to introduce her character. You know, she's unwilling. She's being brought there. She's, uh, you know, very skeptical about the situation. But then she says this. I have to rip out all that plumbing. But other than that, it's perfect. Just perfect. What do you think, honey? Delia hates it. Then she sees a spider. I could live here. So she hates Delia. We already get that. She sees a spider and she says, I could live here. And then we know, all right, she's a little, she's a little creepy. She likes, she likes the weird stuff. Yeah. And, and it's a great introduction. And, and, um, (laughs) yeah. Uh, and it's funny because she's kind of, and, and here's where I will speak a bit to my experience working, working with teens. Um, okay as a high school teacher <laughs> and um a lot of the kids who are i guess you would you would call more like goth um uh-huh. but a lot of kids who feel like you know they're kind of like they're different they're not the like you know peppy getting get involved with every club teen a lot of those kids have seen um lydia as she's kind of like an inspiration Right. To them. And she's, you know, a lot of kids like, I mean, you know, when Beetlejuice the musical after Beetlejuice the musical came out, like songs of hers would become like their songs. And we're not talking about like, you know, theater kids, but they when I'd ask them like, you know, oh, you know, what are some songs that you like? And they would, you know, mention songs from Beetlejuice the musical huh. that were Lydia's. Lydia's songs, but Interesting. um, it so it just goes to show it. Uh, not only does the film continue to have an impact, but the the character as well. I think because on and honestly, it's like this is a girl who's dealing with trauma, and it's not she is. It's not the point, but it's there. It's a through line. She's, you know, she she has a fixation with with death. Um. Mm-hmm. You know, later on in in the film, she does contemplate suicide. Yeah, she yeah she relates to the Maitlands after meeting them, and kind of sees them as the kind of nurturing people who, you know, that she's never had before because she's got her dad who you know they live in New York City. He is some sort of businessman. I can't I think real remember. estate. Is it real estate? I feel but like they're in real estate. Yeah. You know, like he's definitely a a go-getter in his business, which, you know, probably means that he didn't give a lot of attention to Lydia growing up. And if such is the case that uh, Lydia's mother has passed away, which, you know, we don't 
really get an explanation, but if uh, Lydia is with Charles and Delia, it's likely the case. And Delia is this eccentric artist who clearly doesn't give a rat's ass about Lydia. And, uh, or looks at her as being, you know, uh, I don't know, a hurdle. Or just kind of... Not her style. Yeah, she's not trying, she's not necessarily trying to connect to her no. her stepdaughter. Yeah, I mean the only reason why I, I would imagine that if if uh you know Charles had divorced Lydia's mother, there would be some mention of right. like why can't I go live with mom or Yeah, but what I what I appreciate about a film like this is that it's not necessary to explain that. And no, 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 no. I think Yeah. I, no, I think that what uh, what I what I can appreciate about the script is that what's not said still tells you yeah. you can put the pieces together it's also not it, it's it's important i i would say it's it's more important if you're analyzing the character but to to follow the film it's not as as important if you're if you're yeah. if you're analyzing it then yeah yeah, it's, so, it's a point. So, Dan, but. getting back to character introductions, do you remember how uh, we meet Otho? Oh, my God, yes. It's brilliant. Otho oh, you climbs in me. through the window. <laughs> yeah. no, he, That's yeah. how we are first introduced to Otho. Because he's superstitious about coming through the door. <laughs> it's so bizarre. So here is a, a clip of Otho and Delia kind of uh, walking through the house. And, and because I... I could have pulled the entire scene, but it just would have been way too long. So this is kind of halfway through their journey. What happened to these people? They died. Oh, look, an indoor outhouse. Otho. Viridian. Viridian. Now, why do I know that name? Blue-green. Hydrated chromic oxide. Remember, I'm schooled in chemistry. I was a hair analyst. Briefly. We see Adam yeah. with a severed head. Deliver me from L.L. Bean. <laughs> <laughs> Deliver me from L.L. Bean is great. Yeah, so the um, Barbara and Adam are trying to scare them, so Barbara is holding a knife in Adam's head with his body on the ground, and they don't see them. Right. But he living... looks terrified because... It's the living will LLB. usually the living usually won't see the dead. Right. So uh I love that line. Oh look, an indoor outhouse. <laughs> well, all of the lines in there, like Viridian, and when he spray paints the wall, like when 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 or when she I takes love- the can, she spray paints mauve on mauve, the wall yeah. on the wall. And he's like, You read my mind. So few clients can do that. Yeah. <laughs> and he's it's it's like, oh no, he's actually he's not just using it as a figure of speech. He thinks she yeah, because and it's it's interesting because Otho it, you're kind of not sure it's like is this guy just talking out his ass all the time? That's but, the impression I get. I mean, what's I, a hair analyst? Someone who analyzes hair? But um, what? <laughs> uh Although there's one thing he he does say that shows that he knows what he's talking about, and that's when he talks about um, people who commit suicide become civil servants in the afterlife. I mean, yeah, he's right about that, but it doesn't mean that he's right about it because he knows. You know, he could have read it somewhere. Well, but I mean, you're right. Well, he but is that's, a... how, that's how you know things sometimes is you read it somewhere. <laughs> Well, right, but it doesn't mean that he's schooled in it or anything like that. But so, okay, so that brings us to talking about the civil servants in the afterlife and Mm -hmm. Juno, the caseworker. You know, when they get into, so they are, they see the handbook of the recently deceased. I'm just gonna play a clip from that. Yeah. And there's that. This is when they discover that they're probably dead. Uh They see the handbook. Handbook for the recently diseased. Deceased. Deceased. I don't know where it came from. 
Look at that publisher. Handbook for the recently deceased press. <laughs> you know what? I don't think we survived the crash. So, uh, right. So in the handbook, which they find very confusing, which kind of makes sense if they're not book smart type of people, like right. super highly educated, uh, they're clearly smart people, but not like maybe very well read because they have a lot of trouble following the handbook. They know and a lot about what they need to know a lot about. Exactly. Exactly. And so... They do see that uh, what they should do is draw a door on a wall, and that will bring them into this kind of uh, reception area, this kind of help center. And uh, that's where they see all of these people who have slit wrists, maybe have been flattened by a truck steamroller or something like that. Uh, And their caseworker, Juno... Uh, we see has a slit throat because when she smokes, the smoke comes out of the throat, which is amazing. I love that. And it, it makes, uh, you know, it it makes what Otho says completely accurate. You know, it's they become civil servants in the afterlife. And that's where uh, I want to get into Beetlejuice, the, uh, the namesake of the movie. So... This is when uh, Barbara and Adam are talking to Juno, their caseworker, about Beetlejuice. Oh, I've got to go. What about that guy in the flyer? You know, Beetle... Don't even say his name. You don't want his help. Well... We might. No, you don't. He does not work well with others. What do you mean? I didn't want to bring it up. But rather than have you stumble onto it and make another mistake, I'll tell you. He was my assistant, but he was a troublemaker. He went out on his own as a freelance bio-exorcist. Claimed he could get rid of the living. Got into more trouble. In fact, I believe he's been sleezing around your cemetery lately. The only way he can be brought back is by calling his name three times. But I strongly suggest that you remove the Dietzes yourselves. I love Juno. <laughs> She's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, but the, the best way to really get the vibe of Beetlejuice and anybody who's seen this movie, which is probably anybody who's listening to this, but if not, I'd like you to meet Beetlejuice. We just want to get some people out of our house. Ah, I understand, I understand. Well, look, in order to do that, I'm really going to have to get to know you guys. You know, we got to get closer. Move in with you for a while. Get to be real pals. You know what I'm saying? And... <laughs> Save that guy uh, for later. Huh? My wife and I would like to ask you a couple of questions. Sure, sure, sure. sure, sure. Go ahead, shoot. Well, well, for instance, uh, what are your qualifications? Ah, well, I attended Juilliard. I'm a graduate of the Harvard Business School. I travel quite extensively. I lived through the Black Plague, and I had a pretty good time during that. I've seen The Exorcist about 167 times, and it keeps getting funnier every single time I see it. Not to mention the fact that you're talking to a dead guy. Now, what do you think? You think I'm qualified? What I mean is, can you be scary? Oh, oh, I know what you're asking me. Can I be scary? What do you think of this? Excuse us, please. Sure, talk amongst yourself. Adam, let's go. No, I know, Barbara, honey, but I think he could be of some no, use. No, no, let's meet him. Rub something out of ourselves. We just have to talk. Yeah. Hey, 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 hey. Excuse me. What? Excuse me. We are leaving now. Oh, wait. Oh, come on. Don't go yet. Hey, guy, come on. We're simpatico here. Look at us. Huh? We even shop at the same store. Hey, hermano. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. They're wearing the same clothes. <laughs> hey, look, come on. We're like peas in a pod, the three of us. Let's face it, you want somebody out of the house. I want to get somebody out of your house. Come on. Look, we've been to Saturn. Hey, I've been to Saturn. Whoa. Sandworms. You hate them, right? <laughs> I hate them myself. Come on, kids. What do I have to do to strike a deal with you two, huh? 
His head spins around. Don't you hate it when that happens? Let's go, Barbara. Wait, 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 wait. Come on. Just come on for a while. We'll talk inside. Come on. Come on. I'm not staying here another minute. This is a mess. Don't pay any attention to it. Adam, we have to get out of here. I agree, but I'll fix something to eat. Home, home, home. Barbara, how did you do that? Hope you like Italian. Where'd you go? Hey, come on. Hey, where'd you go? Hawk, hey, come on. You gotta work with me here. I'm just trying to cut a D. What do you want me to do? Where are you? You bunch of losers! You're working with a professional here! Nice fucking model! So the Maitlands have a, a scale model of the entire town in their attic, and that's where Beetlejuice has taken up residence. That's what Juno is talking about. And that's where you have your rare F-bomb in a PG-rated movie. That's true. That's true. This is just... A, what a year after PG thirteen came about? Three. Was it three years? I thought. What did I think it was eighty yeah. seven, or maybe so. Uh, no, because Red Dawn was the first. Uh... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's it's just uh, really delightful. But yes, uh, an f bomb. I wonder how that slipped past. I wonder how that was allowed. I think in nineteen eighty eight because. Uh, Caddyshack 2, which which came out just a few months after, also mm-hmm. rated PG, also has has a little F-bomb in there. I think if it's used uh, just kind of as a, if you're not using it in a sexual manner, I guess, they kind well, of let it go. Well, that's what I thought made it okay to be in a PG-13 movie one time. Maybe yeah, the rules have changed since 88. Yeah, yeah, I I think because I know in Caddyshack too, it's Randy Quaid. Uh, he just says a fucking baseball bat, and see, see, I'm wondering if how often that word appears in a Tim Burton movie. Uh, I and Ed Wood. Are there any f bombs? Trying to think of R rated Tim Burton. Yeah, movies. just like anything that could potentially be. <laughs> Although Beetlejuice isn't rated R, so... No, no. I don't know. But, Beetlejuice must have been very close to getting a PG-13. Oh, yeah. It is truly bizarre. It's scary um, at times. While we're in the model, though, let's talk about how awesome the production design is oh, of this amazing. movie. How they replicate the model with, like, the fake grass. And it's like they do everything. It's so real. Everything is so tangible. Yeah. In this movie. I yeah. love it. Well, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense thinking about Tim Burton at this time, like in the 80s, where the the detail, the, everything is so detailed. Thinking to Pee-wee's Big Adventure, you know, like there's so many things that were like, you know, out of the ordinary. And in order to make them feel authentic to the movie, they have to be very meticulously done. And, uh, you know, this is before, you know, a lot of CGI stuff. This is before you could just do that stuff on a computer. So it's like, you know, Tim Burton, even though he worked at Disney and he did all this like other stuff, you know, before he started directing, you know, he got his start doing stop motion and where, you know, you have to create everything by hand. And this is stop mm-hmm. motion in the days before you mix stop motion with, you know, computer generated graphics and things like that. So it's like you have to make things. You have to uh, consider what can go in place of like the full scale objects. And this model is a perfect example of that. It's such an like I would love to just. I would love to just walk on that set. I would love to like actually be in person on that set. It's so cool. Um, Oh, you know, it's so I, and I know, you know, we're, um, you know, we're about ready to, you know, to get to the main event here. Oh yeah. Sorry. Uh, I just got so sidetracked. (laughs) 
No, no, no. But actually, so I wanted to go back to a certain point and it actually, so it, uh, so when Adam and Barbara, after they talk to Juno and Juno's like, get them out yourself. And they're like, okay. Right. So they can't see us. So what do they decide to do is they, they dress up as like Scooby-Doo style ghosts with the bed sheets and right. what's funny is they go to scare Delia and they're they're terrible at it but Delia uh has has taken Valium and uh passes out watching uh, like pro wrestling and yeah, so uh and, and it's funny because Lydia Lydia who I, through like she says cuz Lydia reads the handbook for the recently deceased and it's you know perfectly clear to her um but she she points at out at this point uh, she hasn't read it because at this point she doesn't know about at this is where she meets adam and barbara so she hasn't been up to the attic yet she's tried to go up to the attic but they prevented her from getting up there so she uh, takes the pictures of them because she hears no she them has been making up to- She's tried to go up to the attic, but she put the oh. key in and they forced the key out. So right. this is where she meets Adam and Barbara, where they're wearing the sheets and they're making ghost noises. And she so, thinks that it's Charles and Delia doing some weird sex thing. Right. So um, she takes these pictures because they come out and she takes pictures thinking that it's Charles and Delia and she's like going to humiliate them. And she takes these Polaroids of of Adam and Barbara and then looks at the pictures and only sees the sheets. And it made me think I was like, I was like, wouldn't it be hilarious if it it was kind of like this is the first the only known photographic evidence of ghosts and it's actually sheets with yeah. holes cut out. Yeah. Um, which is, it's funny. And there's no connection made to this. And I don't think there's any intention, but they also talk about how Adam supposedly has a, has a, a picture of Bigfoot as a photo. Of Bigfoot, oh, right. Which even Barbara is like implies is just bullshit. Yeah. I, I lo- every single line is intentional and, uh, just really brings out more and more in the characters. Uh, play one more clip of Otho. Please. Oh, you family types. You've got other things to worry about. Maxie Dean's coming up here tonight. You've got to figure out a way to sell these ghosts. I can only do so much. What are you going to do, Otho? Viciously rearrange their environment? I know just as much about the supernatural as I do about interior design. What I also love about that is that right after he says that, it pulls away to a shot of the house and through the windows, it kind of looks like there's no furniture anywhere. (laughs) I don't, it's like a one second long clip, but if you like, it pulls back and you see through the windows and it kind of looks like an empty house. And I don't know if that's just like a weird visual mess up or something, but I caught it on this last viewing and I was just like, oh my God. But that's what I, what I wanted to point out is like every single line you is inserting more information for you and feels so right. You know, uh, Charles is kind of mo- is mocking Otho. Otho gets to brag about how he knows so much about the supernatural it's just awesome. It's great. Which sets up that he then performs the seance. Right. At the at the yeah. end. And also foreshadows like he screws it up. He does screw up the seance. Like it, uh, they're not supposed to because when Adam and Barbara are resurrected into their their wedding, their wedding outfits, uh, you know, and then they just age really rapidly right. until they de- decompose. Otho acts like like that. Oh, this isn't supposed to happen. Like I don't know what's going on. Which Lydia yeah. does imply that because when when they when Otho's like I have the handbook and like I'm gonna right. do this and she's just like Oh, Otho, Jesus, you can't do a goddamn thing. And yeah, I forget what the actual line is, but it's yeah. So she st- says that he can't even change a tire. Right, right, right. Um. Eh, eh, so it, I love everything is is set up so well. The the device that um that in order 
for Beetlejuice to help Lydia and save Barbara and Adam, she has to marry him. Yeah. Because he wants to cross over. And it's it's right. almost like in a more sinister version of this, it, it would be almost like a Freddy Krueger who's like, in order to, he's like, I want to actually return and terrorize the children of Elm Street outside yeah. of their dreams. Uh, like he would offer to, to, you know, like, you know, Nancy, marry me. Uh, right. and, uh, I, so yeah. I, I love that. I, I love that, that device, um, just all the imagination put into, I love how the sculptures become the, the, like the witnesses well, at yeah, the wedding. Delia's sculptures are, I mean, they're the most Tim Burton-y sculptures you could ever think of. Uh, and, yeah. you know, he makes them come to life and yeah, they start interacting with things. It's brilliant. It's so good. So in the spirit of the what this podcast really is about is like a life after the movie and life after <laughs> the, yeah the afterlife the, the, yeah exactly so uh this did spin off very quickly into a uh, an animated series that i watched when i was a kid i watched it a lot uh there were a few video games that were uh based on it probably a pinball machine i wouldn't be surprised um, I believe you also had the toys. I had the toys. I also had the Game Boy game uh, that was d- modeled after the animated oh, series. Right. Holy yeah. shit. I forgot and about I, that. But yeah, that's right. I played that video. I was, you know, it didn't get very far in it, but I played that video game all the time. It frustrated the hell out of me, but I would play it all the time. And uh, yeah, it was a, a really fun uh, you know, I'm actually going to play a clip from the Beetlejuice cartoon. But how can you blame me, Lydia? Your parents make it so easy. I know, I know. But don't you have any willpower? Willpower? That little voice inside your head that tells you when you're doing something wrong. I never do anything wrong. <laughs> Whoa. I might have spun the wrong way, though. But you gave me your promise. Oh, what's so important about keeping a... Uh, what do you call it again? A promise! And it's important to me! Beetlejuice, I want you to say you're sorry. You're sorry. Beetlejuice, just say it! It. I'm being punished because of you! Until you apologize, these are the last words you're gonna hear from me! Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice! So uh, in the Beetlejuice series, Lydia and Beetlejuice are like friends and they go on adventures together. It's, you know, I don't think that the Maitlands are even part of it at all. I think it's really just the Deetses It's kind of Rick and Morty. It's kind of like Rick and Morty yeah. before Rick and Morty. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. It did so, not occur and then, to me until just now. And then as you mentioned earlier, uh, there was the Broadway musical um, starring Alex Brightman in the role of Beetlejuice, mm-hmm. who was also the lead in the School of Rock musical on Broadway. And, you know, um, and I hear that the Beetlejuice musical was really good. Yeah, I, I don't know if critical, I don't know if like, cr- like critics loved it, but I think it's a really, it's a popular, I think it was, it was especially popular among like families and... Um, right. From what I've, I've seen, only, I've heard good things from people who have seen it. I haven't yeah. like, read any critic reviews. Yeah. If I ever get to direct a high school musical, though, <laughs> I may need to. <laughs> I may need yeah. to take my shot. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to play just a, a, the beginning of one of the songs from the musical called "Say My Name." Destiny's Child, "Say My Name." Oh. <gasps> you could use a buddy. Don't you want a pal? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Girl, the way I see it, your daddy should be leaving and you should stick around and kill him. What? Nothing. So Lydia, don't end yourself. Defend yourself. Daddy is the one you should maim. Together we'll exterminate. Assassinate! No! The finer points can wait, but first you gotta say my name. Go ahead and jump, but that won't stop him. Here you got a solid plan B option. I can bring your daddy so much pain. All you gotta do is say So anyway, that's just a little taste of that. I didn't want to get 
you know, spend the that's, entire four minutes of that song. <laughs> I mean, I'm guessing that that's when, you know, she's going to, in the movie, it's, she, she's planning to kill herself so that she could be with uh, with, with Barbara right. and, and Adam. Yeah, I don't uh, know how closely the musical follows the movie plot. I don't know. I haven't seen I'm it, pretty, unfortunately. Pretty closely to the oh, yeah. best of my... So, Dan, I ask you, what would you do with Beetlejuice? Zillion well, dollar question. Zillion dollar question. So first, uh, there was going to be a sequel uh, early early on um, called Beetlejuice Goes Hawaiian. And right, uh, I did hear about that. Yeah, it was like the, so. It was where the uh, the Deets move. The Deets family is gonna is. I'm gonna read here from Wikipedia. Uh, so take it with a grain of salt here. Uh, in 1990, Burton hired Jonathan Gems to write a sequel titled Beetlejuice Goes Hawaiian. Um, uh, the story followed the Dietz family moving to Hawaii, where Charles is developing a resort. They soon discover that his company is building on the burial ground of an ancient Hawaiian kahuna. The spirit comes back from the afterlife to cause trouble, and Beetlejuice becomes a hero by winning a surf contest with magic. Uh, Keaton and Ryder <laughs> agreed to do the film on the condition that Burton directed, uh, and but then Batman returns. <laughs> you know, <laughs> even though it sounds bananas, I think that it it could have worked if that team was truly behind it and like really just committed to it. Yeah, it's it's kind of like there is a there's like this it's kind of like that like the the chances of of uh of like firing that one shot that's going to get into that little hole that's going to blow up the death star at yeah. the end of Star Wars. It's like there's that much of a chance that Beetlejuice goes Hawaii and is it kind of it sounds to me like the very Brady sequel. Um, well, I mean that is Essentially, the very a very Brady sequel. Yeah, you know, just in the sense that it's like you know complete ridiculousness. Right, right. Um, and and there's been talk of different types of sequels, like Seth Gra- uh, Seth Graham Smith, uh, who wrote the screenplay for um, uh, Tim Burton's Dark Shadows movie. Okay, and um, uh, wrote uh, a- a- Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. Uh, mm-hmm. He wrote a script, and it's kind of it's gone it, it, it it's gone so back and forth that like yes, Beetlejuice two is happening, Beetlejuice two isn't happening. Tim Burton's gonna do it when like it's it's gone so back and forth, and I I just have a lot of. I, a lot of trouble. I mean, to quote what, let me see who uh, Tim Burton said, it's not a kind of a movie that cries out for a sequel. And I have to, that's what Tim Burton said in May, 2016. Okay. And I kind of have to agree with that. So uh, just real quick, I'm going to interject. So, uh, Mm -hmm. and this is getting into this kind of territory. Spoiler alert. So the movie ends with, you know them getting rid of Beetlejuice, and it, the the kind of epilogue of it is that the Dietzes and the Maitlands are essentially living together. They have like an arrangement, and the Maitlands essentially do the parenting of Lydia, and Charles and Delia. You know, using what has happened with the Maitlands, you know, it's kind of sparked them to just kind of live their lives and be happy together. And they just all kind of get along. And that's the other thing is that Charles and Delia are a much happier, much more functional couple at the end of this. And you, even though, yes, Barbara and Adam are are kind of handling more of the parenting. So Barbara and Adam get what they want. They Delia's, get what they want. Delia's career takes off especially she has gotten her cover in art in america well she's also now creating sculptures based on all of these uh supernatural experiences and charles do we get an idea at the end of like what charles is doing or is he just like finally relaxed i think he's just finally relaxed yeah so because he's kind of like and then also lydia 
and Lydia gets what she has always wanted, which is functional. An A on the math test? Adult. <laughs> and an A on the math test, right? Yeah. No, yeah, but she gets functional parenting and, you know, yeah. a, a more stable life. And friends. And friends. And friends. She has friends and- from school that we see. Yeah. It's all of about 10 seconds of screen time, but you establish because she's leaving school and she's like saying goodbye and she's riding her bike. Yeah. She's not wearing black. She's wearing like whatever the school uniform well, yeah. is. And it, it that's just what I love about this movie is that it really knows both in the script, in the direction, in the editing, it knows how to, to make the most of the time it has. And it doesn't, overstay its welcome it leaves you right. wanting more but just because you want more doesn't mean you need to have it so this is where i am this for beetlejuice this is where i am saying let it be <gasps> absolutely nothing absolutely so, there so is dan, nothing so dan I, unless you know unless we have... you thought of something <laughs> well okay well here's the thing is there's already been an animated series very quickly after the movie doesn't take anything away from the movie. There's been the video games. There's been the Broadway musical up until very recently. Hasn't taken anything away from the original movie. And so there's nothing to you. And it could be it could be anything. It could be a uh, an annual Beetlejuice cruise ship excursion. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. Like, it could be anything. It doesn't have to be a movie. Nothing. Then I would let, okay, okay, here, you know what I want to happen? I want some theme park to build, like, a Beetlejuice land where you can go and walk on the model. So, oh, yeah, that'd be cool. Uh, so, I know that, is it Universal, was this Universal? Warner. Movie? Warner. Warner. Then, I'm trying to remember where it is where there's, like, uh, a, a Beetlejuice stage show. Maybe oh, like it's a, like a Beetlejuice stunt maybe it's show. Like, maybe not a stunt show. Maybe it's like Knott's Berry Farms or something like that. But uh, or Six Flags. It's probably Six Flags. Oh I think it's yeah, Six Flags has a Warner Brothers tie-in. Yeah. And Six Flags definitely has some sort of like Beetlejuice stage show. Oh yeah, yeah they probably they they probably do. Not like a full thing with like a full on plot, but like you know a couple songs or something. So anyway, I'll, you know what, Dan, that's totally your, fine because no, we do your, things our own damn way. So yeah. my, and I, I, this should come as no surprise, but I wanted Otho prequel. I want to know <laughs> about that dude's life before the Dietzes. I want to, I want to see him getting involved with all these weird things or not getting involved with them. Maybe he is full of shit. Like, I just kind of want to live in that Otho life for a while. Otho, which is a character that growing up, I never cared for. But on this most recent watch, I was all about that Otho. And uh, just loving every second of it. Just because it's such an awesome character. Would you see that in in the form of a, of a film uh of a of a series either either a film or a series because i could see it being really fun you know uh, to to kind of go along the adventures of otho and like how he ends up going from all these fascinating things to becoming an interior designer not to say interior design is not fascinating it's a noble profession but uh this like chemistry background and you know, all of the work in the paranormal. I, I don't know. I, I I just really the hair analyst thing. Like I wanna get in there. I wanna I wanna learn more about that. And because it's just like such a pompous weirdo character, I've just I'm just dying for more Otho. And poor one out Glenn Shaddix, uh, yeah. you know, passed away n- not I feel like it wasn't too long ago, ten years ago. Yeah, well, eleven years ago. Yeah, yeah. They played years uh, ago. Deo at his uh, funeral. Oh, uh, <laughs> which I can't believe. How did we get through discussing Beetlejuice without once mentioning Harry Belafonte, who's like also a star of this movie? Because the Deo sequence is yeah. like iconic. The Deo sequence, and then uh, at the end we have Jump in the Line, 
jump uh, in the line. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 And and that's another thing that I love about Adam Maitland is that he just really likes Calypso music. Like he just really enjoys working on his model while listening to the King of Calypso himself, Harry Belafonte. Which is kind of idiosyncratic, but I, which I love. I love about yeah. it. And and can I just say, I want to, I'm because, all right, so Tim Burton is one of those filmmakers who, uh, and I think we've, we've talked about this, uh, we've talked about this before, where his, his movies at a certain point just kind of became like, repetitive and like lacking substance. And it was like yeah. Tim Burton surface. I, th- I feel like Tim Burton movies after a certain point are attack. all striving to be Beetlejuice or Edward Scissorhands. I would, I would right. say post, I would say, I would say the post, um, the post like big fish, like when you start getting to like the dark yeah, shadows territory, right um alice in wonderland yeah 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 well i mean beetlejuice definitely helped really define his style i mean i know that it was there before and things like frank and weenie which people hadn't i don't think had really seen up until much later but you know his sensibilities really came out big time in beetlejuice and you know edward scissorhands also Um, but like, you know, the, the, the black and white stripes, like that kind of stuff. And, and, you know, there were some visual elements that happened in Beetlejuice that you see again later in Nightmare Before Christmas. Well, Night Before Christmas, which he wrote and produced, uh, directed by Henry Selleck. But it's, Uh, but, but like Jack Skellington. But it's based on his. Well, Jack, Jack Skellington. I mean, like when Beetlejuice comes out with the big, like carousel. Right. With the skull like, on it, yeah. With Jack Skellington. It's Jack yeah. Skellington. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, yeah, Beetlejuice really is, like, the our introduction to this style. Like, I was going to say, if you wanted to, if if someone, if, if, if you were going to recommend one movie to kind of represent, if, if you met someone who had never seen a Tim Burton film, and they were like, okay, what's one movie I should watch Beetlejuice. that really... I would go with Beetlejuice or Scissorhands. I would probably, I don't, I, I, and I love Batman, but Batman, Batman is Tim Burton adapting to mainstream blockbuster. And, and I love it. But in, in terms of like, just the most pure, like the most pure and most heartfelt Tim Burton films, Edward Scissorhands and Beat and Beetlejuice. I mean, I love I love Ed Wood as well. I think Ed Wood has a great emotional core. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Ed Ed Wood is a fantastic movie, but doesn't really uh, demonstrate the style as much in terms of the things that we definitively uh, associate with well him. Yeah, partially because he made it in Ed Wood style. <laughs> well, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so um, just Tim Burton's filmography, if we're talking about features, you know, it's it's Wee's Big Adventure, then Beetlejuice, then Batman, Edward Scissorhands, Batman Returns, Ed Wood, uh, Mars Attacks, Sleepy Hollow, um, I think still is, we're feeling a little bit more in the in comfortable Tim Burton territory, but uh, Planet of the Apes, I think, was the first like dip of the toe. Then we go back to Big Fish, and then we've got like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Corpse Bride, which I know people love. Um, yeah, Sweeney Todd. Sweeney, Sweeney Todd. Todd was good. Sweeney yeah. Todd was mm-hmm. good. Yeah, yeah. but uh, he got into what what I call Johnny Depp wearing silly hats phase. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and um, on IMDb, it does have Beetlejuice two as being announced but imdb is a a flawed system that uh you know who's to say and and it just has the trivia of you know tim burton says that the film would only be made if michael keaton would return and keaton said in 2014 that this is the only sequel he's interested in doing yeah and you know but and and it's interesting I know we're just going on and on about this, but it's interesting to think about just because 
you know, we kind of are in this new wave of Michael Keaton films. And uh, he's clearly having so much fun. You know, he's going to be in the the new Batman movie. Uh, Wait, the new Batman movie or the new Flash movie? Oh, he's in the new Flash movie. That's right. He's in the new Flash movie. He's in the new Flash movie. Flash movie. I'm sorry. As Bruce Wayne. As Bruce Wayne. Yeah, so it's like, it's interesting that, you know, he's you know, coming back in this way. You know, I... Uh, he was fantastic, obviously in Birdman, oh, and he so good, uh, so good in movies. Spider Man, like Spider Man Homecoming, Spotlight. He was great. Spider Man, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, Spider Man Homecoming, yeah, He's great, yeah, yeah. But this is one role that I, I'd have to say I'd be fine with him not revisiting. I I completely understand that, but Otho means that Beetlejuice would not be part of it. An Otho pre an Otho prequel. You know what I'd be I'd be interested in reading it as a novel. Okay, I'll start writing it. The Journeys of Otho. Okay. Well, John, <laughs> while you get started on on that, uh, let's talk about uh, let's let folks know what what's coming up next. Yeah, Dan, go for it. So, uh, dipping into another iconic filmmaker's filmography here, I believe for the for the first time. That we yeah. are entering the world of Alfred Hitchcock with yeah. 1958's Vertigo. Vertigo. Um, another movie that really uh that really strongly relies on both its score and uh visuals, and we'll 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 get more into that. But yeah, Vertigo, James, James Stewart, Kim Novak. Yeah. And Kim Novak, but we'll get into that. And Kim Novak, yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, um, yeah, so that's, I'm, I'm excited. Our, our first, certainly our, our, not our last foray into the films of Alfred Hitchcock. Right. So, yeah, tap, totally. I'm really excited. Uh, and Dan, as you venture off into the afterlife, I wish you a good journey. Good journey. <laughs> 